the great British countryside, setting for one of the most pivotal battles of the Second World War. Churchill called it the front line of freedom. It was a battle fought by the farmers of Britain. When war broke out, two thirds of all Britain's food was imported. Now it fell under threat from a Nazi blockade. The government turned to farmers to double homegrown food production. The plough had become a weapon of war. It was the farmers' principal weapon of war. If they failed, Britain could be starved into surrender. Now, archaeologists Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn and historian Ruth Goodman are running Manor Farm in Hampshire, as it would have been during the Second World War. Yes. By 1944, the tide of war was about to turn in favor of the Allies on D-Day. Farmers would be crucial to its success, growing thousands of acres of flax to make parachutes, ropes, tents and aircraft critical to the D-Day landings. Accommodating prisoners of war to bring in the harvest and pressing their racing pigeons into service to work as top secret military messengers. Who would have thought the pigeon would have played such a crucial role at D-Day? This is the untold story of the countryside at war. By 1944, Britain had been at war for five long years. The Allies now had the upper hand controlling the skies of Europe and shipping in the Atlantic so imports from the United States could again flow into Britain. But instead of shipping food, they were charged with importing military hardware. So for the farmers of Britain, their drive to double homegrown crop production went on. Meanwhile, the Allies were assembling the largest naval task force in history. The aim to land 160,000 troops on the beaches of Normandy to liberate France from the Nazis. This was the prelude to a full-scale invasion. Three and a half million troops, 7,000 boats and 54,000 vehicles lay in wait in the southern counties of England. They are, Peter. Uh, yeah, they're Yanks, they are. Yanks? Yeah, they're American. Yeah. The military took over 11 million acres of land, a fifth of Britain, for camps, bases, munitions dumps and training grounds. Much of this was valuable farmland. Farmers like ourselves would be watching, you know, convoys like this and thinking, look, guys, be careful. We, you know, this is this, we've got hay there, we've got wheat here, about to drive into the flax field. The amount of land that must have been requisitioned from farmers to actually house them. The thing is, They've got to do their manoeuvres. So they've got to do this somewhere, Peter. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they're all in single file. So any damage to the crop is going to be absolutely minimal. But damage, nonetheless, is, is a bugbear for people like us who have spent the whole war doing everything they can to grow these crops. Key to the success of D-Day was flax from which fibers used to make linen and canvas were extracted. Before the war, this had been imported from countries like Russia and Eastern Europe. But with supplies cut off, it fell to the wartime farmer to meet demand. Parachute webbing, fighter aircraft fuselages, tents, ropes and hoses required vast quantities, so the government instructed farmers to boost production. It was so important to the military that over the course of the war, production was increased from 1,000 to 60,000 acres. Four months ago, the team planted a crop of flax on Manor Farm. It should soon be ready to harvest, but it's not looking good. 
So we want we want the plants to be what about a metre high? I, so? I think at least yeah. waist height. The problem is, is just you know we have had this year, and of course this didn't happen in the war. In, in the war, actually, we were gifted with actually really quite good summers, proving yeah. that if God was on our side. But unfortunately, God isn't on our side in the present because we have had more rain in this last month than since records began. Yeah. Six inches in a month. And it's not a case that, you know, the flax is doing bad and everything else is doing well because not even the weeds are I'm coping well. yeah. with the waterlogging here. Well, it is heavy clay soils and this is the worst soil for flax. Yes. And I suppose the war rag at the time were forcing farmers to go against their intuition and grow crops on land that they knew wasn't yeah. suitable for that crop. And everything's conspired against us. To stand any chance of survival, the flax needs a spell of dry, warm weather. Another threat to the flax crop are wood pigeons, who eat the seeds before they've even had a chance to grow. The team hopes their bird scarer will keep them at bay. But there was another type of pigeon, the carrier pigeon. Often raised by wartime farmers as a hobby, they possessed the unique skill of always returning to their home loft when released. Before D-Day, radio blackouts were imposed to keep invasion plans secret. So carrier pigeons were used to carry messages from the front line. Historian Dr. Chris Williams is showing Ruth how the system worked. I bought you two pigeon containers. Every bomber that goes over Germany, or every coastal command aircraft, has got two pigeons in it to give a distress signal, particularly if it has to land in the sea, they've not got the radio, they're in the dinghy, you can let the pigeon off, the pigeon flies back to its own home loft, and that can be what the difference between life and death for a bomber crew when the radio doesn't work you use an animal instead. The military had no time to train up enough birds, so civilian racing pigeons were often used. Many were parachuted behind enemy lines in France, picked up by the resistance, and then given messages with intelligence to courier back home. The box will be dropped on this parachute. Good Quite great. a small parachute, but pigeons land well, and they're quite light, over enemy-held territory. This was done about 16,000 times between 1941 and 1944. That's, that's quite amazing, isn't it? In a war that has radar, radio, yep. mm. <laughs> sort yep. of modern communications to mm. all intents and purposes, oh, they're still using carrier yeah. pigeons. This is one of the interesting things about this war, is the different sorts of technology. You know, you've got the Allies have invented the atom bomb, and they're using hundreds of thousands of pigeons as well. I've heard, and I'm not frankly quite sure where, that this medal that's given mm. to animals for bravery has been won more times by pigeons than yeah. any other that's species. That's right. During the Second World War, pigeons got about 30 of them, horses about three, dogs about 18, but pigeons were way ahead with this. We've actually got one here. This is the Dickin Medal, which was awarded to a bird called Mercury. Um, of the Army Pigeon Service Special Section. Mercury was a spy pigeon. Now, if your <laughs> pigeons work well for the RAF in the routine way, or particularly if they can home across sea well, they might get picked up for special service. Mercury carried a vital message 480 miles from the Danish resistance to Britain, making her the most celebrated of all wartime carrier pigeons. But although this homing instinct came naturally, Carrier pigeons had to build up their stamina to fly such long distances, and farmers would have trained their own birds. What you've also got here is a diary of a pigeon trainer, and what he's got is records of how he's sending his birds away. You know, um, Saturday, 12th of December, two more young birds, um, all flying well, except blue cock with bad foot. You know, and he's recording mm. every day how his loft is working, how he's managing to train them to know where they are and to come back to his loft. If you're going to be training pigeons, you'll need a basket to which you can take them out and start releasing them to train them. And so this is your basket you'll be needing to have sooner or later. Oh, right. That could be a bit of a task for you, I think. Oh, that, that looks a bit more challenging, doesn't it? 
this summer is turning out to be one of the rainiest on record. So Alex is making preparations for what looks like being a damp flax harvest. This is my old um, raincoat. It's seen better days, to be honest. It's uh, developing a few holes here and there. Um, but one of the major problems is that it's just no longer waterproof. And what's happening is the rain, once it gets in, gets across the shoulders and you get all crampy and, and, and rheumatic. So uh, it is in desperate need of a waterproofing. He's making a traditional waterproofing solution with ingredients found on the farm. And this is our beeswax from June. We extracted the honey from this and the wax has been kept in this little muslin sheet. So that's going to be the first ingredient. Still a bit sticky. So we'll get that in there. Next, Alex is adding linseed oil, produced from flax seed. It's highly flammable, so he's taking great care when warming it. It's got perfect waterproofing properties, this stuff. So that's going to go in with the wax. This is the most dangerous part of the enterprise. This is where we add the paraffin. And the thing with the paraffin is it just really thins the mixture. And ideally, what I'll do is hang this up to dry and the paraffin will actually sort of evaporate off. Now, it will leave a bit of a smell for a while, but I'm not too bothered about that. Right, we've got the perfect consistency now. So we're all ready to go. The only problem is, it's incredibly hard trying to paint onto one of these jackets just on a table. Got a bit of an idea. Peter? Oh, you all right? Yeah. Can you, um, just give me a hand a second? Yeah, sure. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> we'll prepare that later. Um, can I just, can I just turn around a second? Let's see, just run with me on this. I'm just gonna try this on for size, Peter. Let's try this on. So if you don't mind, I'm now going to paint on some boiling hot wax and oil. <laughs> How does that sound? <laughs> It feels OK. I can't feel the temperature, but I can just feel your gentle brush strokes massaging my shoulders. Ta-da! Yeah. Perfect. While they wait for a break in the weather, Ruth's making a pigeon basket. 200,000 carrier pigeons were used by the military, so the demand for baskets was huge. Like many traditional crafts, basket making saw a massive resurgence in the war. It's amazing the variety of baskets that were being made during the war, and so many of them with, with a military purpose. I mean, there were the agricultural baskets, the potato harvesting baskets, there were the domestic baskets for carrying people shopping, and people still needed that stuff. But then there was a huge range of hampers for parachutes and baskets for pigeons. So there seems to have been a, an enormous demand and a growing demand for pigeon baskets during the war, with all these carrier pigeons being needed to take secret messages here and there. I mean, how do you move the pigeons? You've got to move them somehow. Ruth's made the base of the basket. Now she needs to form the sides. Oh, God, this is where it gets hard. Oh, right. Somehow, these have all got to go upright. In front of two. It's amazing, too, how the strength comes to it. I mean, these are really flimsy-looking little bits of stuff, aren't they? And yet the whole of that is made of just intertwining. And it's as rigid as heck. I'm really enjoying this. I really am. It's probably the sort of basket that would make a professional willow worker wince. So many of these crafts, yes, it takes a lifetime to be really good at them. But making some sort of rough stab, you know, it's just a matter of having a go. The revival in basket making meant new apprenticeships were established. The craft became a reserved occupation, meaning basket makers were exempt from military service. Even the Women's Institute got in on the act running classes in the art of basketry. 
It actually looks like a basket, doesn't it? I know it's a bit wobbly. I know, I know. It's not exactly the most geometrical of baskets, but... <sighs> Alex and Peter are monitoring the flax, but the constant rain is destroying it by washing nitrogen, which is essential for plant growth, out of the soil. The War Agricultural Executive Committee, known as the War Ag, issued advice on using chemical fertilizers. This is ammonia nitrate. It's a, it's a chemical fertiliser, OK? I mean, obviously, these are chemicals that occur naturally, but certainly by the Second World War, they're being used in their chemical form to fertilise crops. Right, so that one's loaded. Yep. You going to be all right pushing this one then, Peter? Yeah, I think so. Using a tractor in this waterlogged field would ruin the crop. So the boys are using a hand-operated seed barrow. Rotating brushes scatter the fertiliser through adjustable holes in the sides. A bit like walking on a, a high wire. <laughs> Is that heavy? It's not light. Well, it's all right. The thing is, chemical fertilisers weren't new in the Second World War. They'd already actually been around long enough to generate a sort of reactionary group, people who believed firmly in organic fertilisers and that using organic products was good for the uh, health of the land. But of course, in a wartime situation, you couldn't afford to take those views. And in fact, in taking those views, you were actually seen as being unpatriotic. Although chemical fertilisers had been around since Victorian times, during the war, pressure from the war ag saw their use triple. Someone like me, who doesn't really want to use this kind of stuff, would be in a situation where the war ag's saying to them, you know, you've got to get out there. You've got to use this kind of stuff. You've got to use chemicals. It's the only way we're going to win this war to produce food. They still need a spell of dry, warm weather to encourage growth and to dry out the field. But instead, their bad luck continues. And now the rains are coming. Wonderful. This could prove catastrophic for the flags. Ruth has spent the last week learning the art of basketry. The carrier pigeon basket is finished, ready for Peter and Alex to begin training. Here we go, Ruth. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Look, 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 look. It does actually look like a basket, doesn't it? So what is this? It's just willow. It's willow. Yeah. It's willow. So what do you reckon? I think that's perfect, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's not exactly perfect, I'll be honest. Oh, well, for a first attempt. Yeah. Oh, I'm so pleased with it, though. Yeah. I know, so you I know. Be. So you're going to take it away and fill it full of pigeons, then? Is that the plan? Yeah, we're going to take it away and fill it full of good pigeons. Good pigeons. Carrier <laughs> pigeons. Bad pigeons. Yeah, and then we're hopefully going to release them, and you should get the messages coming back. And you break my basket, you die! <laughs> Alex and Peter don't have birds of their own, so they're calling on pigeon fancier Leonard Painter. That's off. Leonard's raced carrier pigeons all his life. Birds like his would have been drafted into military service during the war. Mind your head. Mind your head, right. Mind your head. Started off small in 1946. Right. It's gradually grown bigger. As it, rather than get rid of pigeons, you add a bit on. Most of these older ones have flown from Pau in the south of France, which is 540 miles. You see, that old fella there, he's 19. He's now. 19 years yeah, old? Yeah, But he flew from south of France six times. That's over 500 miles. Really? Could you pick us out uh, a good-looking bird, the type of bird we'd need today? Have you got something they're in here you could show us? Good -looking. They're all good-looking. Of course they're all lucky, <laughs> of course. Uh, That's what my, my mum used to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> The boys are going to train Leonard's young pigeons to home by taking them away from their loft and releasing them, at first a short distance and then increasing it over time. To transport the birds, they're using Ruth's new basket. 
So that's a disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's her first. It was her first attempt. <laughs> yeah, first very good. Attempt. I think yeah. making. bold and admirable. <laughs> oh, that's a female. That's a female. Right, right. Yeah. She's not like being handled. Right. Because you have to put the lid down quicker. Then they'll be out. One up there, is there? Yeah. Come on. Any of these, you've taken them 30 miles, he's back in 30 minutes. Leonard was just a boy when troops were gathering here for D-Day, but he remembers local homing pigeons being recruited to carry secret messages back from France. So we're, we're all pigeon keepers during the war, uh, responsible for producing birds for the war Not effort? Not all of them. If you didn't join, you didn't get food, that's all. So you, everybody in the club joined. Right. Because otherwise you didn't get an allocation of feed. And it's okay. just feed for the, the birds. Birds. Oh, yeah, right. not, not humans, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <No. laughs> Particularly around the period of D-Day, I mean, this was such a crucial operation yeah, right, yeah. that everyone had to observe this sort of radio silence. So that's essentially where these pigeons would have come into their own. That's right, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We used to wait and see if we could see them come back. And only once I see a pigeon come back in 1944 with two messages. It came from somewhere in France. And the pigeons would fly back here. It would then be your job to, to get that message. And take it to the local police station, which was... As yeah. soon as possible. Yeah, that, that was there. They had a briefing once a week. Mind the head. Oh, sorry. Carrier pigeons were crucial to the war effort, and the government issued strict instructions for farmers not to shoot them. Wood pigeons, however, destroyed crops, so the Royal Observer Corps tracked flocks down to be shot. With meat rationed, it was a welcome addition to the menu. As pests, of course, anyone could take pigeon just like they could rabbit, and therefore, if you're in the countryside, it was an extra source of meat. Wartime, you suddenly find that many people who had been sort of rather sniffy about them before were suddenly only too keen to eat rabbit and pigeon. And many people from the towns who'd never, ever had them before in any way, shape or form discovered the delights. You can see what a small bird they are. I mean, many people hardly bother with the rest of the bird. They just use the breasts, the two pieces here, and sort of barely bother with the rest. But it makes such a good, rich, brothy stock. I'm going to make the most of that. I'm going to use every last little bit of him. So these are being boiled in broth, stock, whatever you want to call it, with no additional fat. In they go. Alex and Peter are heading out into the English Channel with skipper Nick Gates to train the carrier pigeons. Releasing them from a boat got them used to flying over water, essential for birds bringing back messages from the French resistance before D-Day. Good stuff. Like carrier pigeons and farmland, the wartime government also took control of fishing boats, including this one, the Ocean Pearl. We're actually on a, a wartime boat, are we not? Well, that's right, she was built before the war, built right back in 1933 as a fishing boat. Right. But she was requisitioned by the Navy. This vehicle would be running things like food supplies yeah, to and from the bases. Yeah, I, I suppose uh, um, maintenance stuff and uh, fuel, fuel oil, that sort of stuff. Rum. Rum, yes. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> also, I mean, being farmers, uh, our land would have been encroached upon by the military. I suppose fishermen, you don't think the fact that their boats would have been also taken. So that's their livelihoods going as well. That's right. This, uh, I think it was used by the Navy for, I think, about four years. It's just amazing, isn't it, about how the ministry was getting its tentacles into every aspect of British society and industry. Not only were farmers being put under pressure, but fishermen too having their boats requisitioned, and even pigeon fanciers having their pigeons taken <laughs> for the war effort, you know, all with one thing in mind, to defeat the enemy. These are our carrier pigeons. They're currently in the basket that Ruth's made, and uh, they're all set to go. We've got the messages. We just need to tie them onto their legs, and then we'll release them. But we're not going to release them all together, because if we do, 
the other birds will follow the first bird released, so they won't do any work. And the idea here is to train them, keep them exercised, so they can find their way home. Gradually, the distance is increased until they're capable of returning home from hundreds of miles away. Right, message in greaseproof paper. Right. To keep it waterproof. Our first pigeon, Peter. Even today, no one quite knows how they find their way back home. But scientists believe they may have an inbuilt compass and use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate. Just let him go. Yeah, I think Are we so. ready? Here we go. That's that. he's fast, isn't he? Here we go. Ooh. I hate to say it, Peter, but Southampton's that way. <laughs> it's got a chicken stuff. <laughs> Ruth's cooked the wood pigeons for an hour and a half. Now they've cooled, she's preparing a wartime salad. I'm just going to take the breasts off first, whole, just the four of those, because they'll look nice in the salad. One of the great things about pigeon or rabbit is that they're full of flavour. You get way more taste for a small amount of meat, really. And that really helps in wartime cooking. You think how much of wartime food is about potatoes and bread. You know, it's, it's sort of bland, 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 bland. Stodge, stodge, stodge. And anything that brings a bit of flavour in is a huge relief. And then I'm supposed to arrange the meat in the bowl. According to the recipe, I'm supposed to make it look attractive. Not quite sure how I do that. During the war, the government encouraged the nation to eat a salad a day. Raw vegetables were recognised as being good for health, especially when living on a rationed diet. Ruth's rather unusual salad is set in gelatine. Seems a bit odd calling it a salad, really. It's more of a terrine, isn't it? But that was the wartime way. Almost anything that got served cold was called a salad. And then that can just sit and set. Despite Alex's misgivings, within half an hour, all the carrier pigeons have returned to Leonard's loft, completing the 30-mile journey with their messages. Oh, Pigeon with Leonard, the message. hello! Pigeon with the message. Oh, my goodness, that's not ours already, is it? Yeah. Wow. So, in wartime, I wouldn't have been allowed to open that. I would have had to take it straight off to, to, to the, the police local station. To the local medium, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And then they would have forwarded the message oh, yeah, to whoever you, it... Oh, yeah, you're not aware what's in there, other than the fact it's, it's a carrier. Right, it says, Ruth, weather's good, wind southeast, light, basket's still on boat. <laughs> what time's dinner? Yes, well, hmm, what time's dinner? I haven't finished it yet, but yeah. I'm amazed. Pigeon That's pine, so fast. Yeah. During the war, 98% of pigeons returned with their messages but often with mortal injuries. I'll see you again, hopefully. <laughs> I was dead excited. <laughs> Take care. OK, thank you. A good hour after the pigeons returned, the boys are back, in time for Ruth's revitalising wood pigeon salad. This looks absolutely fantastic, Ruth. Well, salad-tastic today. Yeah. Wartime salads. So, I mean, this is a salad in jelly? Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? The salad really just takes off in the wartime. Everybody's eating all sorts of different types of salad, things they never had before, like grated carrot and grated beetroot, you know? I mean, you just don't find them pre-war. I have to say, that, um, that pigeon does look fantastic. Oh, no. uh, we're calling this a bad pigeon because, obviously, it's feasting off of the land. It's, mm. uh, it's the enemy of the farmer. Whereas yeah. our good pigeons, it's amazing to think how many pigeons were pressed into service during the war. And, you know, everybody's so excited about all these new communications, you know, and the radio being around, but all this radar, this high-tech stuff, and we're back to pigeons. Mm. As well as pigeons, farmers also had land requisitioned by the military. By 1944, there were 623 airfields in Britain. Many were like small towns and built almost entirely on good agricultural land. 
farmers were living cheek by jowl with the military, and many witnessed fighting firsthand, not on the land, but in the air. The Ministry of Information recognized that this war touched so many people that it should be interpreted by painters as well as photographers. Artist Leo Stevenson is following in the footsteps of the war artists. I can't believe Good we won the war. Hello. 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 As you might guess, I'm an artist. Yes, we can see. We can yes. see. Yes. Right. Well, um, I wonder if you can help me because I'm going to try and imagine that I'm back in that period yep. doing an officially commissioned work of art as if I'm an official war artist. So these aren't paintings that artists are doing just for the love of it. These are things that are actually commissioned. Can you imagine that amidst all the confusion and the anxiety of warfare, the British government actually found in its heart and also found the money for official war artists? Now, they did this for three key reasons. Firstly, to protect the best artists, to preserve their lives to also um, protect their livelihood because nobody's going to buy art in time of war. But most importantly, to, to say something about the, the real experience of warfare that the press couldn't. Basically, the idea is this. You're working in the fields, minding your own business, as people did. Yep. Meanwhile, 10, 20,000 feet up there, people are trying to kill each other. And the sky is full of contrails from the aircraft. Yep. But life carries on. You have to produce the food. You have to keep the country going. Leo's taking photographs, from which he'll base his painting. Peter, if your hand is like that, that sort of thing... That's the kind of thing, that's it, go for it, right, right okay. OK. Right, thank you, just hold that for about two hours and I'll be done. Oh. Hundreds of German aircraft were shot down over Britain, and if the crew survived, they'd be captured as prisoners of war. Perfect. By 1944, women were being drafted to work in factories rather than on the land. So POWs were put to work in agriculture to help double crop production. Farmers found themselves face to face with Germans, who told them rationing back home was far more severe than in Britain. Hold on to there. Yeah. Push in like that. Even the humble loaf was hard to come by, as bakers Emmanuel Hajandro and David Carter have discovered. I've been looking at um, a recipe for uh, a black type of bread. It, it really has very, very meagre ingredients. We have here... Yeah, I'm looking at some of these. <laughs> and they, I mean, they look more like this kind of stuff I'd feed an, an animal. Yeah, well, um, it, in, indeed, this is something you would feed an animal because um, this, this black pile here is silage. Really? Um, and uh, we're using silage here um, because commercial yeast wasn't available. It's fermented uh, grass. When anything that ferments has a, has a byproduct, one of which is the gases that enable bread to rise. We have just chopped up grass. That, I mean, that's desperate, isn't it? That, that is, is desperate, but, but don't forget that, that wheat is a grass. <laughs> and this is what was known as tree flour, and tree flour was, in fact, wood shavings. So, sawdust. Sawdust. Yeah. So <laughs> th those are, uh, are these ingredients. To the silage and sawdust, David is adding chopped fermented rye to help the bread rise. But this wasn't without its dangers. Rye is highly susceptible to ergo fungus, which, when eaten, can cause convulsions and gangrene, even death. It might also be good to put something a little sweet in it. Now, right. sugar, I... Very uh, hard to come by. Very but hard to come by. One thing I have got, we've got bees and we're producing honey. Marvellous. So this so is... So that will certainly assist the flavour. As Germany's position weakened as the conflict wore on, this is just the kind of loaf ordinary Germans were forced to eat. Pat that down. Yet in wartime Britain, bread was never rationed. I think that would have been regarded as a, as a very uh, retrograde step on the part of the Ministry of Health. The minute you start rationing bread, you're really telling your public that we are desperate. We're losing, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you think this is going to rise, then? Yes, I'm confident it will. Excellent. And how, how long are we looking at uh, baking this for, then, do you think? Uh, we'll try it for about 35 minutes and okay. see what it looks like. So I'm going to put it in the oven. Yep. And we'll wait and see what happens. Good, I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. 
Artist Leo is beginning to sketch out his painting of war in the countryside. You're, you're from round here, aren't you? I've been for 81 years. Oh. In 1944, pigeon fancier Leonard Painter remembers clearly the countdown to D-Day when tens of thousands of troops, ships and vehicles amassed in the fields around Manor Farm. So uh, tell me about D-Day. I mean, what was it like round here? Well, it was just like a um, closed day in army camp, really. You couldn't go anywhere without a permit. It was barbed wire across the roads, and you had a permit to go down there if you wanted to. It's a sort of total lockdown. Well, it right? was, yeah. And every every space, field, grass, verge, was army equipment and tents and, and, and soldiers camped out. Hundreds of them. We had a field day when we were boys. <laughs> well, what did you get up to? And what sort of stuff? Well, then the pub, the, the, the American soldiers used to line four of us, five of us nippers at. Yeah. And the one that could drink a pint of beer the quickest would get a packet of Chesterfields or Camels or, or a wad of chewing gum. Brilliant. Yeah, but <laughs> I haven't touched it since, mine. Oh, well, but, uh, the big nippers used to lap it up. Yeah. Well, I'm tipsy drinking bloody beer. The German silage bread has been cooking for half an hour, and now it's the moment of truth. Are you feeling nervous, David? Absolutely. Nervous but excited, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> it's like giving birth to a new baby. Hey, wow, look at that. Wow. It's black. It looks like a German black bread, doesn't it? it? it I'm, I'm amazed. It, it really does, does look like a loaf. OK, so it looks like a bread. Yeah. The question is... Feels like a bread. <laughs> Feels like a bread. <laughs> Is it going to taste like, like a bread? Like a bread. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, are you going to be the first guinea pig? I am indeed. Good man, there you go. The first person since Germany 1944 to eat silage bread. It's not inedible at all. It's not inedible well, at all. In, in terms of flavour, I mean, I'm chewing away on something that's not going anywhere. But the flavour's surprisingly nice. I think the flavour's nice right? and sweet. Mm. Mm. It's very sweet. Yeah. And that's not just the honey, is it? That is the no. silage. No. But again, I mean, if, if you only had this to eat and you didn't have anything else to eat, yeah. would you choose eating grass or would you choose to eat silage bread? Oh, I, I mean, you, you would, wouldn't you? Yeah. You can yeah. see, you can almost see how they've arrived at that as a replacement yeah. for, for black bread. I'm having to swallow the wood. A cup of tea helps it down, no end. Mm. Or rather a Steiner of German Indeed. beer, I think. Indeed, absolutely. Mm. From rough sketches and photos, war artist Leo is beginning his painting. The idea of this stage is just to rough out the approximate forms of uh, where things are and gradually develop a sense of tone. Now here we want some trees. The idea for this little dramatic scenario is that these aircraft have suddenly appeared and you can almost not hear them until the last minute. The war does seem a very strange time to start officially commissioning artists and paying with public money for works of art, but it was actually a very important thing to do. But they weren't just making it for their generation and to sort of entertain themselves, if you like. They were going to say something for future generations, post-victory, for us. And the point is that an artist could say something about the real experience of warfare the horror of it, especially here in the countryside. The one thing this art isn't is propaganda. This was about real experience. It's not about what the government wanted to portray as such. In fact, some of the images produced by some of the best artists were sort of contrary to the government message, if you like, but they didn't mind that, within reason. After a week in the studio, Leo's painting is finished. Capturing the moment, a German Messerschmitt 110 was shot down by an RAF hurricane. Right. 
goodness. That's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you. Wow, you worked yeah. hard on that, haven't you? One of the things that's so hard for us to get to grips with, I think, down here is the concept of the war encroaching on people's lives. Yeah. You, you yeah. get an impression, but you, you'll never get that sense. Yeah. Yeah. But it's brought into sharp relief here, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is a reality for farmers in, in, in wartime Britain, wasn't it? Th this was, yes. I mean, that, that, that's, the thing. It's, 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 that's the thing about history. It's, it's connecting with real experience. Well, I think that's brilliant, and really... Thank, thank you, Leo. Really do. Thank you. Oh, thank thank you. It's just a shame we can't hang it in the farm. <laughs> it? This would go off now to the Ministry of Information, is that right? Well, yeah, I mean, if I'm a wartime artist, this, this, this has been paid for by the government, so this will be sort of taken to, to some uh, government source. It'll be shown around uh, an exhibition going, going around the country, possibly, um, and then... After the war, these paintings were, were sh shared out amongst government buildings and little local museums. If it was relevant to a particular place, right. as this is here, you'd probably find a local museum for it or something. For the past month, the team have been battling to save the flags. But one of the wettest summers on record has finally got the better of it. Alex and Peter have no choice but to write off the entire crop. As in wartime, this is partly the consequence of having to sow crops on unsuitable land. I don't blame you, Alex, you know. <laughs> I don't blame you, it's the weather. It's the heavy clay soils and the weather. I mean, this must have happened during the war. The Ministry must have asked people to put crops into ground that it just wasn't suitable for. And in fact, we do know that, but with flax, we have learnt a really hard lesson here, haven't we? We have. I mean, the one thing I do know about flax is it hates heavy clay soils. Well, that's the only good thing, Peter. This was famously one of the hardest things to harvest, and in getting this all wrong means we don't have the back-breaking job of harvesting it. You really shouldn't count your chickens before they hatch, Alex. Why is that, Peter? Because a neighbouring farmer does have a crop and he does need to harvest it. And I said, well, ours has failed. We did schedule in a harvest. We can come help you. Who's we? You and me. <laughs> and a few prisoners of war. Anyway, as much as your coat's waterproof, the rain's coming down hard, let's just get in before yeah. it really get out of us. Alex and Peter are heading to Simon Cooper's farm to help harvest his flax. Unlike the boys' crop, Simon's was grown on well-drained light soils, so it's fared the wet weather much better. It's now turned from green to brown, indicating it's ready for harvest. Hi, Simon. Hello. Hi. Just Hello. admiring your flax crop there. Oh, thank you. Well, we, we've got a crop not as good as we'd have hoped. We'd have hoped it to be a bit taller, a bit thicker, but, you know, a year like this, you know, we're, we've got to be grateful for what we've got. By 1944, there were 60,000 acres of flax in Britain. All the plants had to be pulled up by hand to maintain the long fibres in the stem. During the war, extra labour had been provided by land girls, children and conscientious objectors. But with the Allies in the ascendancy, prisoners of war became an ever-growing source of labour. Johann Custodius's grandfather was a German POW. Johann studied the impact they had on wartime agriculture. So how many POWs were there working on the land? So there were about 150,000 uh, Italians and about, at peak, about 300,000 Germans. Almost every uh, fifth worker in agriculture would be a German POW. That's amazing um, to think. Johann, I've noticed we've got some prisoners of war over here that have got these red diamonds on the back. What does that signify? These coloured patches were, yes, uh, so that you can actually see these prisoners of war and spot them so that it would be more difficult for them to escape. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, yeah, primarily so that you could identify them when you sort of see them working in the field or when you see them somewhere else. I guess it makes sense, Peter, doesn't it? I mean, they've been designed for camouflage, don't they? Yeah. So you've got to try and reverse that by putting a <laughs> fucking great big red <laughs> mark on their back. <laughs> So, D-Day, Operation Overlord, what sort of effect did that have on the, the sort of attitude of German prisoners? Well, D-Day had a massive effect on several fronts. I mean, on the, uh, the effect on the Germans was in, uh, in the camps in Britain. Uh, then 
realized that the war was pretty much over. D-Day was, was the point when most of the Germans actually came to Britain because there were obviously masses of German prisoners of war captured in France. So they were, many of them were shipped to Britain. On the one hand, a, a kind of a logistical nightmare. On the other hand, increasing overall the amount of labor uh, that you can use. Another important source of wartime labor were gypsy travelers. Their nomadic lifestyle lent itself to the intense but short-lived harvest work. Dr. Becky Taylor is an expert on how war affected their lives. Like everybody else, they were massively affected um, by the changes of the Second World War. So the men went off to fight, um, and this left uh, women and children and older people in the community in quite a difficult position because life on the road is hard. So a lot of families where they could, they would roll up on farms and then be there for a much longer period of time than they perhaps would. And of course, farmers were desperate for the extra labour, so they might be there throughout the harvesting season and pick up from sort of the pea harvest right through to the different sort of fruit harvest, yeah. through to potatoes and uh, sugar beet and things like that. And right. then if they'd worked, then they could often then stay over the winter okay. and have developed quite close relations with farmers who they were working with. And there's others who are saying, actually, they're um, camping on land that I need for my crops. And so you right. get a lot of tension locally. But some of the farmers are very happy to have them there and saying they're essential because they need them working on the land. After a day of back-breaking work, the flax crop is almost harvested. As we're pulling it, this is quite green, some of this, isn't it? Yeah. So it just needs to dry out a little bit more, doesn't it? Yep. And then this is going to be turned into, well, pretty much everything. Just about anything from canvas to ropes. Parachute harnesses, hose pipes. I tell you, that has been a remarkable thing, is just finding out just how many things this stuff is used for. Yeah. Good stuff. By early June 1944, everything was in place for the D-Day landings. 160,000 troops were ready to go on the first day. Millions more would follow. Carrier pigeons brought back messages from France with information on the enemy's movements. Now, everything depended on the weather. Local historian Bob Nimmo is showing Alex and Peter the remains of a Royal Navy camp called HMS Cricket, just a stone's throw from their farm. It once covered 125 acres of woods and farmland. Essentially, people stationed here were here to practice for D-Day. Yes. Right. Yes. OK. And prior to D-Day, there would be about 4,000 odd people living, living in the camp. Right. And then when D-Day came, it was pretty nearly empty, apart from the base staff. So yeah, this everybody had gone. So what, what part of the camp are we going to? We're going to the extremity of the camp. Right. Which, if you can see, one of the... Oh, yeah. Possibly one of the central ablution blocks, and clustered round that would be 20 or so Nissen huts. This was HMS Cricket during the war. Nissen huts built in the woods were standard accommodation for troops, and here there were 110. There's a set of steps here. At the end of the, a Nissen hut, there would be a step, I think. This is a base for a Nissen hut? This would be a base for a Nissen hut. So how many people would you have had in, in a Nissen hut of this size? I understand there are about 20 or 24. So these would be your, your sort of pals that you were yeah, ultimately going to find they, yourself? They would ultimately be together as a flotilla going across to D-Day or being taken across on board a ship to D-Day. Yeah. This is a map of the camp, and we are up here. Oh, OK. There was a cinema and a naffy building there. So a, a cinema? Of, oh, yeah, a cinema. And people came down and entertained them. Um, George Formby, I think, oh, really? came down. George Formby? George Formby, I believe. And, He's um, one of my heroes. Was he? Yeah. Well, you're probably training on the same spot. Do you think uh, George Formby might have he stood might here have stood at on this, this Nissan very hut? spot playing his ukulele <laughs> or whatever he did. <laughs> <laughs> but also, the Americans played baseball in the square at, at Botley. Really? Um, so all of this happening right on the doorstep of our farm, Manor Farm. Indeed, yes. 
the flax is harvested. Next, it was processed to extract the fibers from the stem used to make linen and canvas. Anne Cooper is showing Ruth how it was done. The first stage was to soak the crop in water, known as retting. So this is our retted flax. That's it's right. It's been in the water. First, we need to get these seed heads off because we don't need those for yep. the fibre. And we're just deseeding here, which is also known as rippling. <coughs> and uh, that was another thing. It's very Rust. dusty. Very, very dusty. dusty Even it? in the factories, um, you, you'd have a tremendous amount of dust around. That's it then. Right, we've rippled. Job done. Now it's time to break, am I right? Indeed. So the purpose of breaking then is to crack away the outer um, core. So it's quite a quick, hard action, but you can see it see breaking it all, away really yeah, well. All those little bits of straw like stuff flopping up and down. And it's softening up already. <laughs> Processing flax by hand was labour-intensive. But as demand grew during the war, the process became mechanised. So although this is a little mini hand one, this is more the sort of thing that was found in the wartime flax factories. Yes, but in a, a lot larger scale, obviously. Now we, we actually... Feed in from this side, do we? this end. And it does feel like you're breaking something. It does, it? doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Next, the flax is scutched to remove the broken bit of outer stem from the valuable fibres within. Now, we've already got waste, haven't we? That's no longer part of the main bundle. That's what you would call tow. Mm. Tow would be used for cordage, for twine. Very, very important, although it seems like a cast-off, not wasted It's going to be saved and it's yeah. going to be turned into righty hair. Heckling then separates the fibres into individual strands. This is just combing. It's like combing your hair and you're not worrying about pulling the knots out. Exactly. So this oh, is isn't that to go change, isn't it? That really is starting to look like hair, flaxen hair. So turning it into thread is just a matter of twisting the fibres together, isn't it? This fibre could now be woven into canvas or linen ready for military use. Really. I'm trying to break it. I can't break it. Look at this cutting my fingers. Look at that. I really can't. From such a delicate little blue flower in a field. To the strongest of fibre. Fantastic. Strange though it seems. You can't... I can't imagine how we would have won the war without flax if we hadn't had the fibre for the parachutes and the webbing and the camouflage That's nets right. and the hose pipes and the, and the tyre covers and the, everything. We, we would How never would have done it. it. How would we have done those D-Day landings? We, we couldn't. We couldn't. As D-Day grew ever closer, three and a half million troops packed into southern England and its villages had never been so vibrant. Foreign troops formed close bonds with the locals drinking together and playing games. Today, baseball is thought of as an all-American sport, but it was very popular in Britain before the war. And in 1938, Britain had won the first Baseball World Cup. So the team are recreating a game that took place here in 1944 with the American troops. It must have come as sort of sweet relief, you know, if you're thinking yeah. about around here, gearing up Operation Overlord, you don't know whether you're going to live or die. No, 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 it's good, isn't it? You need yeah. something to let the tension just... Yeah. just to be able to control yourself, let alone anything else. Whoa! Ooh. Ooh. Must have been such a melting pot of cultures. Yeah. You know, right Absolutely. here we've got the Americans, we've got British from other counties, it's German POWs, POWs, Italian Ten. POWs. And even just within Britain, you've got people of all sort of classes and all different areas of Britain, all sort of mixed up and dumped into the countryside. Mm. Oh. Yeah! Oh, yes! <laughs> it's a stupid game anyway. <laughs> I can't play cricket. It's a fairly decent game. It was the three two to count, nobody on. There must have been such a high of activity back yeah. just prior to Operation Overlord, prior to D-Day. 
and then the weather's right, the time comes, yeah. everyone leaves. All, all overnight, sudden, yeah, one be... night. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? It's not yeah. moving out by degrees. It is one yeah. night, isn't it? Everyone a whole lot. Goes. Yeah. Must have been really eerie yeah. afterwards. Must have got so used to this life, this vibrancy, and then all of a sudden, nothing. Stillness and just reports coming back on the news. It's like, my lord, I knew these guys, and they're there, and they're, they're dying in the, the thousands. Who's the beer? Over here, come then. There you go, young man. Cheers. Chin chin. Mud in your eye. Cheers. 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 Productions were often put on for the troops through organisations such as was it Entertainment's National Service Association, ENSA which the populist folk thought stood for every night something awful. So on that thought, <laughs> I give you Alex Langlands. Thank you. OK, this is a song. It's called When the Boys Come Back From War. When the boys come back from war It was the bravest thing I ever saw With Hitler and his mob will wipe the floor Soldiers were unable to travel to the theatre, so Ensa brought the entertainment to them, as well as George Formby, Tommy Cooper, Spike Milligan and Laurence Olivier all worked for ENSA. Around, you pretty girls and shed a silent tear Cos George Formby's got a melody that'll fill your heart with cheer When Paris falls we'll be on top, Berlin City our next stop We'll sing the songs we did before when the boys come back from war of June 1944, in the early hours of the morning, 7,000 vessels, the largest armada ever assembled, sailed to the Normandy coast and began the liberation of France. D-Day was the turning point of the war in Europe. But for the farmers of Britain, victory was still another harvest and another year away. Next time, the team faced the conditions of 1945. They harvest their wheat using the latest machinery. Incredibly tense for Peter and myself. You know, this is a whole year building up to this harvest. Attempt to restore fertility to their fields. So we've got to put some heart back in the land, and this is the machine that's going to enable us to do it. And experience how the nation celebrated victory. Well, he's a jolly good fellow. So say all.